how they show. So we move on and find out that the functional theories, basically they emerged from Europe, to be exact, from Germany. So these theories, they emerged basically in Germany. And then we're going to say that, uh, see of ourselves that these four main theories or theories, how these theories, uh, what was the significance and what was the practical aspect on which these theories focused upon, in which gave them the name, the title, that these are functional theories from Germany. And uh, my view, their contribution is immense in terms of translation study. So uh, the functional theories from Germany. The 1970s and 80s saw a move away from the static linguistic typologies of translation shifts and the emergence and flourishing in Germany of a functionalist and communicative approach to the analysis of translation. So around about the end of the uh, 20th century, last two decades, 1970s, 80s, a move away from the static means linguistic typology translation shift, shifts of the approaches which we have discussed earlier, uh, you know, in terms of Eugene Nida's model and talking about Jacobson and, and others. But here they move more towards the functionalist and a communicative aspect. Uh, communicative approach means that which anything which is done, which is it is related with the sake of communication, with everyday usage. When you, you need anything for communication, that is obviously to communicate, to relate with somebody at on day-to-day -day basis, on daily basis. So it is something very practical aspect. So in a way, what it means is this, the theory, uh, as the theory of uh, as it evolved, it is moving more towards the uh, practical aspect. Okay, and with this, these theories, they emerged in Germany. So in this context, the following four theorists and the works are noteworthy. We're going to talk about that the, that the contribution of four theorists, um, you know, in Germany and their uh, type or their model of, um, or their theory of transition and also what did they focus upon. So we'll take, first I'll just, these are listed below. I'll read out, the first one is, Catherine Reis's early work on text type. Text type is the model. Then number two is Justa Hall's Mantara's theory of translational action. So the second theory uh, was put forward by Justa Hall's Mantara. And then the third by Hans J. Vermeer's Scopus theory. Scopus theory. And then the last is Christine Nord's text analysis model. So these were the four, uh, you know, theorists and, the, and their contributions, and their contributions are noteworthy. Now we are going to have a look at each one of them individually, and then I'm going to explain to the that what does this, how each theorist of this theory was different from the other, and what practical utility or practical significance it had. Okay. So details of these theories are given below. So we move on to the first type of theory, which is titled the text type approach. So the text type approach was propounded by Catherine Reis. Uh, and in the works in 1970s, she builds on the concept of equivalence. But in her view, it is the text rather than word or the sentence where communication is achieved and where it equivalents must be solved. So in a way, uh, Catherine raised her contribution was significant because she focused more on the overall text, you know, what are, instead of focusing on the words or sentences as earlier theorists had been doing, in, you know, in their works, uh, Catherine basically focused on is that it is the, you need to focus on the text or as it is, and find equivalence in the text rather than focusing on each and every word and sentence. I mean, going through the details of word and sentence, this is because it's more important if you have an overall uh, translation and equivalence in the terms of text. And uh, so that you know that this is, uh, when you're talking about text, that is the uh, stage where communication is achieved and where equivalence must be sought. So that means overall, uh, you know, communi for communication and, and the equivalence, it's better to focus more on the text instead of uh, words or other parts of a sentence. 
So her functional approach aims at systematizing the assessment of translations. It borrows from Carl Bowler's three-way categorization of the functions of language. So she was inspired from uh, Carl, uh, Carl Bowler's three-way categorization of the functions of language. And further, uh, ways she links the three functions to the corresponding language dimensions um, in, the, in the text types. So now uh, I'm going to explain a little bit what she actually meant uh, because as you see in these uh, slides, these are just broad outlines. So I'm going to read from the text, and maybe in a day or two, I will again uh, make those handouts ready, and they will be. I'll be. I'll post them on your Google Classroom. Um, you know, handouts comprising about seven, eight pages, which are related to the functional things. Although these lectures will be there, recorded lectures will also be there, but the the whole the actual text will also be there for your opinions. Okay. So now let me explain to you uh, what uh, she implied. So the main features of each text type are given up, up below. And let's have a look at each one of them individually. The first was according uh, to this informative text type. And in, by informative text type, it meant that it uh, comprises a plain communication of facts or information, knowledge, or opinions. Because uh, as you see for yourself, as the times move on, translation is gaining significance as something from practical aspect, as from the, uh, from, you know, I should say communicative aspect. So when translation is conducted, these are the different types of texts, uh, because the title of, uh, you know, this uh, approach is text type. So we are going to have a look at what are the different types of text. So the first is the informative text type. This could entail, it could be comprising of any text which would, which would relate with different facts. It could also relate to information. It could also focus upon knowledge or opinions as it is given. So the plain communication of facts it entails information, knowledge, opinion, etc. And the language dimension used to transmit the information is logical. So in such text, the language which is used to convey the information is a very logical and it is um, or referential. That means everything is spelled out written in a clear-cut manner. There is a logical sequence as well. Uh, and the content of the topic is also a main important focus of the communication. And this type, as we know, text type we call the informative text type. So what it entails that within this type of the first type of text, whatever is given, uh, it, it could entail, uh, you know, a, a text comprising of information or knowledge or opinion, but it will be an organized, it will be in a logical manner, and it might entail, there might be some references as well, but everything or the content of the topic is done in which from the sake of uh, communication. And we call this informative text. And from the word information, giving information about something, knowledge, eh, opinions, eh, or facts, or something. But obviously, whatever is given is in a very organized manner. So that was the first text type. Now we move on to the second text type, and that is titled expressive text type. Uh, yeah, expressive text, uh, text type means that it would include creative compositions, and the author uses the aesthetic dimension of language, and the author is foreground. So this type of a text, if it is used, if it is taken for translation, it means that the author uses some aesthetic uh, dimension. Uh, by aesthetic dimension, it would be something creative uh, in terms of maybe from literature or a poem. Uh, and so it would entail the aesthetic dimension of language, and the sender is also uh, foregrounded as, a, as well as the message is also there and we call this type of text as an expressive in, in which a person, a writer or a poet expresses, expresses his or her feelings, emotions or ideas or anything. So it's a creative composition and you know always poets and poets and writers and novelists they are creative. So it's a creative composition as, compare, as com compared to the previous one which was information, it would be any type of information, knowledge, opinion, it's a newspaper, music, it's a topic, you can take it, that is information. But your creative composition or express means, expressive means, the second type model means something related with 
creative writing, something with aesthetics and something with related with, I think, creative writing on the part of the writer, poet or so. Uh, now, let's move on to the third type of um, text, and we term it as the operative text type. So the third type of text is titled operative text type. Let's see what does it mean. This type of a text type includes or inducting behavioral responses. The aim of this text is to appeal or persuade the readers of the book. Let me explain what does it mean. This type of a text, basically um, the purpose, the aim, the rationale of this type of a text is a kind of an appellative function. Appellative function means that it uh, it appeals to the, it's an appeal to the reader or to the person, uh, you know, who is the receiver of the text on the, on the target uh, text language uh, point, and that this something, this text when is presented to them, the target audience becomes the receiver of the text, and that it entails, this text entails that they are supposed to act in a certain manner. Act means that a kind of behavior, it kind of, uh, you know, they are uh, expected after reading this, something which would appeal to them, and which in which they would be practically, they would respond to it and act to it in a certain way. So this type of language mm, is basically used in the form of a dialogue, or these it's dialogic in nature, in which entails dialogue. And it focuses on uh, this particular, that you appeal to somebody. And we call this type uh, text type as operative. It's an op example of an operative text type. Then uh, we move on to the fourth uh, model, and that is the audio medial text. A fourth model, or I'm sorry, the fourth type of text included in this model of Catherine Trees. So this is, let's see that what are these audio medial texts. This includes such as films and visual and spoken advertisements, which supplement the other three functions with visual images, music, etc. So as I said, from the title, from the word audio, audio means you are listening sometimes to jingles or music or ads, you're watching these on TV, and it could also include films and visual and spoken advertisements, which mostly we watch on TV and sometimes we hear if we on, on radio. So this basically supplements the other three functions which you've already uh, talked about earlier informative text and expressive text type and operative text type, but it is supplemented. That means it, this is something on top of what is already there in the three first three. This is basically supplemented with more auditory visions or with visual images, with music, and so that naturally anything which entails that it um, appeals to our different senses, it is more, um, I should I say, powerful. And it has its, it, it, it has a deeper effect on as well and more important. So this type of uh, strategy in text is also used, which is a component and which is used in films, in particular advertisements. You know, in the, and how do they persuade the people who watch those ad, uh, advertisements or hear to this audience as a whole discipline of marketing, which entails that just by you know if any new product is launched, the way it is presented in an ad has a very powerful impact on the target audience or the, on the receivers of the target text or the target, uh, you know, when they hear that. And then it leads to how, you know, uh, trend, it changes the trend in that. Okay, So these are <clears throat> the examples of four type of text types they are given here. Now I'm just going to uh, look at it, uh, you know, in, in the examples to you, you just have to be attentive. Uh, that a kind of examples of each of these four different types of what do they actually imply. So examples of the text varieties or genres as they're presented here. With each of the th uh, these texts, they're presented, uh, you know, with the help of a diagram uh, uh, and for the reference. And let's see what do they mean. So the first type um, is, if you look, I'm, I'm going to share this table with you probably by next class, in which the, what I'm going to explaining to you, that way you'll have a copy with you. So the first is the text type, if you have a particular language function, uh, you know, and then, uh, uh, you know, it would include uh, informative, first category, and then um, within that, the type of language will be used, will be logical, content-focused, 
and then there might be some referential content and it would be the method of translation in the informative text type would be plain prose uh, explanation is required because you are just communicating facts and figures and information isko jo translation ka method hoga plain prose hoga you can have in the source text some uh, referential content uh, but it will be a, a very focused sort of a, uh, approach and it will be logical as I explained earlier the informative text type mein approach hamesha logical hoti and then information would be presented either it is explanation about different objects or something so this is related to the information text type and example of that let's move on to the second category the expressive text type the expressive text type basically it expresses uh, or focuses on the sender's attitude remember i said that expressive attitude is related with creative uh, poets and artists and all that so it expresses clearly the sender's attitude the writer the sender the sender of the message that is important and uh, the type of um, language of release because i said it belongs to aesthetic language it could be poetry or short story and it again focuses on form and then it transmits some aesthetic form as well and basically it uh, it, it uh, the approach it follows it adopts a perspective of source text and when translating such type of a text that means creative composition or story or poem uh, the job of a translator is to adopt the perspective of the source text or the author that means from where the source text came it is the same style should be adopted or changed in the expressive text type although it's an aesthetic uh, dimension of language and as i said it could be literary uh, you know from literature or anything but it has to be kept in mind that the translator has to do it uh, has to adopt the perspective of the source text author okay let's move on to the third that is the operative text type now the operative text type basically in simple words it means that you are making an appeal uh, to, to to the person who is receiving the text to this who is receiving the translated text that uh, it appeals how does it appeal to the to, uh, to it would be something like a dialogue and it could be it could have a equivalent effect and it could also mean you know uh, changing the mindset changing the persuading the listeners the readers uh, to this such a text in terms of you know uh, persuading them to to change the mind let me go on to some more specific examples of these categories if you look at the operative text which i've just thought the best example of operative text would be the advertisements and it would be also the electoral speech when these uh, you know in different uh, in, in the times uh, you know in terms of uh, political maneuvering in terms of you know, time of elections when uh, these uh, different uh, participants or the politician should i say when they embark upon this uh, mission of you know uh, for for the election they tend to make electoral speech a kind of a speech in which they put up their agenda in such a manner to appeal to the target audience to the target audience in their case is the voters for whom they have to bring up a very rosy sort of a picture that these are the reforms they plan to do or what is this and it's electoral speech ye agenda hai is tarah ki so in this type of a text operative text is when you are inducing some behavioral responses from the audience and you are kind of appealing or persuading the readers of the text readers or listeners of the text that they should uh, you know to listen to you attentively and kind of they should be influenced and you are appealing the appealing to them persuading to them a kind of behavioral response in terms of i give you the example of you know politicians when they come up with an electoral speech that in terms of you know seeking the votes of the people another example of operative type is the sermons okay you're all familiar it's very common and this is what happens in our mosques and friday prayers or other prayers um you know the the uh, religious uh, clerics and the uh, mulanas they all come up with their own religious sermons and obviously they are in a position in a very very powerful position in terms of inducting and you know gain this uh, kind of affecting upon the behavior the responses are changing the the responses uh the talk uh the, you know it's just like a flock you know for the religious character to inspire them for a change or to persuade them or to the 
to do this. So it would be either the sermon would be written one uh, in which they would be uh, it would be translated, or it would be an oral one. Uh, but the, it's the same is the text means that when it's translated, that the tra translate, translation of such a text which, which relates to this aspect, sermon or lectoral speech or advertisement. This is what the bottom line is that it induces, it, it expects a certain a behavioral response from the target audience, from the readers or from the listeners, and it kind of appeals to them and persuades them. So this is the aim of such a text. So naturally, as a translator, who's translating such a text has to be very careful. And as I said, the overall aim of all uh, this approach by race was the actual content whole content of the text, not upon each and every word. Remember, this is what I explained, that this is what uh, uh, text type uh, model was, that it, it more focus on, you know, on the whole text rather than the word or the sentence, okay? And and the way it, it appeals or takes uh, on express uh, kind of communication. Then uh, we move on um, another example of expressive type. I'll give you the example of expressive type in terms of Aesthetic dimension of language. This was would relate to, say, creative writing, a poem or a play, or even a biography. But a person or no, an author who's written a biography related about his own life, uh, life, you know, events and all that. Or if it's a play, or it's a poem. Again, um, it's an expressive text because it's a creative text because, and it appeals its aesthetic dimension of language because the way the author puts these ideas. Together, it's an uh, aesthetic dimension of language, the way it is used, and because obviously these are learned people who have a, who have a good, or should I say, hold of the language, at least of the source language, and if it has to be translated into the target uh, language as well, so the translator has to be equally good, well versed in the target language in terms of translating the poem or play or Bible with focus on the creative aspect of that, the aesthetic dimensions. And then uh, on top, the, the first one, the informative text type, uh, a particular example of this category would be anything like even a lecture, like today's lecture, for example. This is an example of information text type in which some facts and figures and some events, some knowledge, some opinion, or something, it's a lecture, and it's giving, giving you something information related, related to a new topic. It's like new input. It's like you are come, becoming aware of something new. It's like new input, which is being presented to you. Okay, so again, the job of a translator who is translating such a text, mind it, it's a lecture or it's a report or it's a reference book, and for that matter, it could also entail other type of text. For example, a tourist brochure. Now, this is very common as tourists. If you travel abroad, going on a holiday, you know, you need to read to be able to read details of the place. You are going to in the tar, uh, you know in your own language, obviously that in, in the target language, and uh, translated from say the source language text. So again, it has to be seen that uh, information is given in plain language, facts, figures, clear cut, and there is a logical sequence. Remember that I said, so that when the translator does this job effectively, whatever is presented in a informative text type, text type, it's something very clear to the target audience reader. Okay. So let me recap this whole the category of uh, these four. All these, all these four of them, they have come under the broad heading of text type of approach or a model to translation, which was propounded by Catherine uh, Catherine Ries, and this was in Germany. Okay, and uh, the last one um, is we talk about. This is a kind of a hybrid sort of a model. Um, Go, um, audio audio med medial kenge. so uh, there are the hybrid types in in which uh, somebody wants to join in which there are something um, others involved as well so it would be something attempting to persuade you're pers persuading the uh, uh, you know certain way of attempting a function and then as i said that hybrid types is also you know keeping in mind the predominant function of the source text and then and now we move on and see that um, the text type, I hope these four models are clear to you. Now we move on and see that what is, uh, you know, the role of target text, or what, uh, how should it, in what form should it be, should it come up, um, if it's properly, 
text type models are followed. So number one, the text, the target text of an informative text should transmit the full referential or conceptual content of the source text. So we're coming back to the first category, informative text type. The target text, which is based on this approach, would obviously transmit or convey the full referential conceptual content of the source text mein jo kuch bhi diya gaya hai. when the target text is based on this first model informative text type it will convey each of them transmit each and everything with full reference and a, and a content and then it will be written in plain prose as i just uh, said again and there shouldn't any redundancy, redundancy shouldn't be in repetition or anything you know extra things and uh, it whatever uh, you know explanation is required it should be there so the end product of a, of a target text which is based on this information text type approach this is what it, it will convey a full referential complete it transmit or conceptual content of source text ko convey kiya gaya hoga completely in a target text and it is the language will be plain prose okay and there shouldn't be any redundancy or anything anything extra or anything any ambiguity or everything should be clear let's move on to the second uh, the target text of an expressive text type so i'm focusing on number two that the target text that means the translation which is conducted of expressive text how should it look uh, it should transmit the aesthetic and artistic form so uh, because this model or this text type pertains to aesthetic or it pertains to uh, this aspect of language as a creative composition or poem or a poet. So the translation should use the identifying method with the translator adopting the standpoint of the source of it. So that means anybody who is embarking, you know, uh, an expressive text type for translate career, he has to be very careful in terms of transmitting, conveying the exact aesthetic, artistic form in the source text, it has to be very, uh, you know, it, honestly transmitted it, uh, in terms of from the source text to the target text. So, wohi chize convey honi chahiye overall, the aesthetic and aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic mode of the source text. And then the translation should also use identifying some method uh, in, in which they do adopt the standpoint of the source text author. As I said, that this could entail the source text author in this case would entail a poet or a story writer or a novelist or a creative writer. So, uska standpoint lena bhoat important hai. It shouldn't be that when a translated version comes up in this category, it's a total different stance. Uh, usme liya gaya. The stance should be the same. The standpoint of the source author has to be maintained in the translated version. Okay. I hope this is clear to you. Let's move on to the third. The target text of an operative text. So we are here at third point, operative text type. So the target type, that means the completed target text, that means the completed translated version, with when it will be presented based on this model, it should produce the desired response in the DT receiver. Of an operative text, it should produce the, des uh, it should employ the adaptive method, creating an equivalent effect. So in this case as well, operative, uh, uh, you know, a text is, uh, as I said, I gave you the example of a sermon or an electoral speech or an advertisement. Again, the desired response, which was actually given in source text, has to be maintained uh, in the target text as well. Okay, And then we move on to the fourth, the audio medial text. This requires a supplementary method, supplementary written words with visual images and music. So as I said, that these audio medial texts are basically used in films and visuals and spoken you see in spoken advertisement and films and visual, they're also accompanying a certain text or voice text or book. That is so they would always be requiring the supplementary. But this is for sure that when you are using this text, audio medium, a text written text, it has to be accompanied with something more, including just not this, uh, you know, the written word. It should have some visual images or music in order to supplement it, in order to complete it, in order to uh, you know, make it more presentable. So the audio, video, um, the, the text type, how is it presented? Because naturally, as it said, the more um, anything which appeals to more senses is more powerful. 
And this is what happens is you have seen it for yourself, the audio middle text as they're presented on the radio or TV, and the new product is launched. How if it is launched in a proper, appropriate manner, it because it has a very deep impact and it does it does trigger it uh, you know brings a change. It's a complete uh, change which can uh, it can bring if it is uh, presented in an uh, effective manner in the source uh, in the target text. Uh, so, uh, uh, with these four uh, categories, I've explained with the help of examples. Then we are just going to talk about is that basically uh, this writer uh, is focusing on uh, is he makes a list of intralinguistical and extralinguistical instructions given is when somebody is translating is by intralinguistic criteria for the you know instructions for the translator is that uh, within the language intralinguistic of it is that semantic grammatical stylistic features should be kept in mind appropriate from source text to target text ye cheeze aap ko the translator has to keep uh, check on semantic lexical grammatic stylistic features of the source text have to you know have to be taken on on board and they have to be conveyed and transmitted in the target text and then the second is the extra linguistic criteria this would mean situation subject field time place receiver sender and implication so ex extra linguistic means that other things depending upon the text type if it's say an example of expressive or, or literary then you have to keep in mind the time it was uh, presented or the place or who are the receivers or the dealing and effective uh, you know other aspects which are conveyed like humor irony and emotions and all these are played now uh, we move on and we say that uh, sometimes uh, you know it happens as as the uh, as Ra as as race points out and she says that sometimes you know these different types of text types uh, you know this is what catherine race says that normally um, the writer of a source text has some other uh, should i say uh, ideas or principles in mind um it's not just one principle in mind there there might be more than one principle or maybe one the more than one reason for such a writing such a text and then um it gives an example this that uh, in particular catherine gives example of uh, maybe you are familiar with jonathan swift's gulliver's travel if um, you must it is you must have read it if, if you haven't read it uh, in yep. literature we uh, i mean i'm Okay, that's good. This is what I was going to say. Even as uh, a children at school, maybe you must have read this version, the story version about Gulliver's Travel. It was so originally uh, Jonathan Swift, when he wrote Gulliver's Travel, it was um, it was not just a novel to appeal to the aesthetic dimensions of language. It was basically written. It was a satirical novel. You know what is a satirical novel? What is a satire? Uh, it was basically and yes it was basically a satire on the government it was a satire on the government of the day um, and in a way it was mainly an operative text usme sirf usme ye text nahi aap keh sakte ki it was just an expressive text it was an operative text as well because it was meant to be a satire a satirical novel on the and it was an attack on the government of that day and mainly it was the policies of the government and what it was leading to but of course what we see is, is the actual rationale of writing this um, you know gulliver's travel and if you are familiar with the theme you see it is that wherever uh, gulliver goes in whichever it is it's whether it goes to lilliput or in the land of the little people or goes to broadingham where he comes across big uh, giants no no society is perfect nothing he goes wherever he goes wherever he travels he says that man is there and the man the idiosyncrasies and the man is uh, he is not perfect so wherever uh, you know gulliver travel takes his readers doesn't find an ideal a perfect society each society has its own issues its own problems so this is what jonathan swift's uh, rationale was to present it in this satirical novel an attack on the government of the day and it was at that time mainly meant as an operative text maha us waqt usne as an operative text tha because he wanted to adapt to appeal to the people the common people in terms of 
you know, a kind of, a, 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 should I say, taking up cudgels against the government's policies. But now we see what is nowadays. Nowadays, when you look at this, the same novel, Gulliver's Travel, it's taken as we did, it's an ordinary entertaining fiction, it's just taken as a piece of literature, and it is read, and it's included, not only that, it's also included in the different, uh, you know, from off and on, it is included in master's level course as well. And so it is, uh, you know, just see that how uh, the same text, the same how it was originally written, uh, with the operative text in, in mind by the actual writer, Jonathan Swift, and now it's taken more as an ordinary entertainment function. It's more as an expressive text. So, aki text ko kaise with changing times, with changing scenario, the same text text type is interpreted in a different manner. Okay, so it is taken as an as I say ordinary and entertaining fiction. I should say. Then altern alternately, a, a target text may have different communicative functions from sources. So sometimes the same is the case. You can have a target text. It may have different communicating functions as compared to the source text. And you know you can't have a one-to-one -one relationship. It fixed unka role nahi hoga. We have seen it for ourselves, and you you come across other examples as well in which you find that it could be it was the way it was originally written and the way it is. It has its its applications later on in different times. Okay. So um, an operative election, similarly, he so talks as alternative yet a target uh, target text may have a different communicative function from a source text. For example, an operative election address in one language may be trans translated for analysts in another language interested in finding out what policies have been presented below. This is something another good example. That if we talk about election address of any politician, okay, say election address of an you know, uh, we just uh, recently we watched the elections taking place in the United States of America. To so any operative election address addressed by the main two contenders, it was Joe, Joe Biden or it was the other one, Trump. So whatever language it was written, it was transmitted in the source language. Um, at that time, it was a uh, simple election address, operative election address. Did they aim to, you know, to aim to, uh, should I say, uh, to appeal to the target audience, the voters in that context. But later on, the same text could be used later on, say, by different think tanks in terms of looking at it critically, looking at what the policies of United States of America is. So, if text ko aapne, agar it was presented as an operative text that way, it could be analyzed later on, maybe as an information text type in a think tank or somewhere when people are doing research on US policies and all that. So the main, uh, uh, the bottom line is that of all these four different types of text types, when they are translated, fine, um, yeah, as a, uh, from source text to target text, it has to be seen that we have categorized them into practical dimensions, core functional aspects of four different types. This is what uh, Catherine has done. But they, it could also mean that they could be used okay, interchangeably later on at a different time. Okay, and then. Uh, it also, there is some criticism on, in particular, this model of uh, Catherine. In terms of, it is normally say, said that when these models or proposed translations are conducted uh, with the specific text, there's certain plane, certain words, certain, uh, they have to be, uh, should I say, maintained from the source text to the target text. Because this it means, say that if you're talking about information text type, it's related to something should I say with the economy, with the with the profit, with the should I say the markets? Uh, uh, when we talk about the share markets, to be exact, and you must have heard this familiar with this word that the market is bullish or bearish. You have terms sunning hongi very common. So these type of terms in the uh, when they talk about uh, uh, you know if, if share markets and in financial terms, bullish and bearish. And then we have other words in terms of profits. Kesat, you always tend to use the word that the profits have soared or they have reached a peak, or it's opposite hoge that it, they have dived and there's a plummet. And similarly, there are other types of words which are in terms of a particular language. So this somehow um, the, the job of a translator is important to kind of stick to these words because these words have certain important connotations 
in the in the in the market of business and in financial tax and uh, you know they, these words have specific connotations so they should be maintained um, as close as possible by the uh, target in the target uh, language and translation okay because they're fixed translations fixed meanings and they have to be kept in mind all that okay um so class um this was uh, the main thing I wanted to do with you. I will just move on to the next uh, model. For the detail of this model, uh, we will uh, do, inshallah, uh, in the next class, which we have on, I think on Wednesday. But since it's there, I'll just give it an overview or reading. But I'll explain to you in detail um, in the next class as well. So just I'll take another five minutes, and then uh, we are moving back to question and answers. Anyway, we move on to the second main type of text which was introduced in Germany. And this is known as the translational action model by Holtz Mantel. As, as you can see, these are German authors, German writers, theorists. So naturally, uh, you're not familiar with their names and uh, you know uh, uh, the way their names are spelled and then they, they are uh, pronounced as well. So this translation action model. It was proposed by Holtz Mantery, and this model uh, was uh, by Holtz. It takes up the concepts from communication theory and action theory, and it aims to provide guidelines for a wide range of professional translation situations. And this approach views translation as a purpose-driven, outcome-oriented human interaction and focuses on process of translation as a message transmitter involving intercultural transfer. So this is, as you can see, it's loaded with some very practical terminology. This, this, should I say, the description of this model. So this model, the very title, Translational Action. Again, it's related with something related with action, and it's related with communication. And that's why it is. Uh, it takes up the concepts from communication theory and action theory. And it also provides a, a kind of guidelines for a wide range of uh, other professional translation studies. And this uh, this main uh, function of this approach is that it's a very focused one. It's, it is, uh, this approach is followed in translation for certain purpose-driven approach or outcome-oriented. That means you're more bothered about that what would be the impact if this translation version would be presented to the target or what would be the impact of this. Then it also involves human interaction. And it also focuses on the process of translation as it is that is involved, and as as and how does the process evolve from the message transmitter, and how uh, when it's transmitted, you have to see that how it is done in an intercultural uh, situation, how it is done that or in an intercultural transfer me how does it happen? So um, uh, you know basically, holes uh, uh, mantar is saying is that it is, uh, it's not about just translating words and tenses of text, but it is in every case about guiding the intended cooperation over cultural barriers, enabling functionally oriented. So any person who's translating such, uh, using this model uh, for translation, the focus would be again, as I said, the overall, uh, you know, it's not simply just translating word for word from word to sentence of that. Overall main thing is, you have to see that it's the message is presented in a, in a manner and the cultural barriers are also more or less you try to overcome that so that when it's presented to the target or it is presented in such a manner that if they they don't find any inhibitions and they don't find any cultural barriers between the source text and the target text or the source language or the source language users or the target language users for whom the translation is so this model uh, would use interlingual translation, and it's used as a translational action, uh, you know, and uh, then from a source text. And this process will entail certain important series of roles and players. This is what they're listed below, uh, and the initiator, commissioner, source text producer, the target text producer, target text users, and target text receivers. This and others, inshallah, I'll explain to you in much detail when we move on, when we focus on this theory in detail in the next class. And uh, so with this, I've come to the end of what was my planning for today. Now, if um, there are any questions on your mind, please, one by one, you're welcome to ask me questions. 
and uh, all these lectures you know uh, they will uh, will be the audio will be loaded on lms as well and they are already there in your uh, google uh, google classroom okay so all these i'm sharing with you everything is there for you okay now you can uh, ask the questions and then i'll again uh, just confirm the attendance okay yes who is it Okay, who wants Ma to ask? What category are we going to put in the movie subtitles or YouTube closed caption? Can you repeat the question? It's not very clear what you said. Ma'am, um, I'm asking that in what category, in what text type are we going to put in the movie subtitles or YouTube closed captions or dubbing? I think it's there are also translations. I think they would come in the fourth one, the audio medium. Me, I can. This me, I can get the dubbing, supplementary method, written words, visual images. Because do so many to because it uh, what you say. Us ke saath to sound bhi hai, na? It accompanies. Its audio part is mandatory, isn't it? So, just me audio part mandatory hai. Wo to isi me aa raha hai. Visual images and music as well. So you have the visual images and the music is or the audio part and all the other things. So uh, you know it would entail that. Okay, I was also wondering that um, one of these days, maybe, because in order to give you a practical orientation, what translation is, I wish we had on campus classes. We could have thoroughly enjoyed this. Up to put my interactive activities, Karapi. But I do plan to give you some exercises of translation. You are familiar with at least with these two languages from Urdu into English and English into Urdu. At, la at least for you to see that how it is done, a kind of a practice that how translation is conducted. Okay, fine. Okay, any other question? Yes, please. Right. Okay, any other question, please, from the class? Okay, where is Kinza? Is Kinza here? Is Kinza in the class? And yes, ma'am. Okay, Kinza is here. Okay, Kinza. So, um, uh, as you said, that just a few students are left. So, I hope they send you their uh, 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 their 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 assignment, and, and then you can uh, and put them together. together. Okay, now I just okay, now I just want, 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 want want to double check the attendance. Double check the attendance. Okay, Ifanullah, uh, Ifanullah, not here. Not here. Ibadullah. Ibadullah. Yeah, man. Present. Man, present. Is uh, is uh, Ibadullah here? Ibadullah here. Uh, and Irfanullah is not here. And then Laiba Noor. Ma'am, I am present, Irfanullah. Ah, you late join kiya tha? Come on time. No, okay, Start. okay. So Irfanullah is here. Ibadullah is not here. Uh, Laiba Noor. Laiba Noor didn't join today, and Zahiruddin is not here today. And what about Imran Ali? Is Imran Ali here? I think not here today. So Imran Ali is not here, and Zahiruddin and Laiba is not in. Ibadullah is not here, and I think that's all. Right? Okay, class. Then, inshallah, see you. Ma'am, Ajaz uh, Shahin present with them, please. Huh? After I have put it, who I have not taken, they are present. I am just thank calling you. out the names of those people who, who didn't join. Okay, then, then class. Thank you so much for today. Inshallah, see you. Uh, meet you on next uh, coming Wednesday. Okay, thanks a lot.